and, and thank you to all of you. And we have some time for questions. And I know you all have burning questions that you want to ask. What I'm going to ask for you to do, just since we don't have a lot of time, Kim in the back has a microphone. Raise your hand, and we'll get those questions. That actually, I'm going to get you because you're here. Well, raise your hand. We're going to ask one question at a time. I'll call on you, and we'll get the expert up here for you. So, Kim, I'm going to start up here. I'd like to thank the panel uh, for taking the time to do this. Um, my name is Frank Arkiaga. I'm with the uh, uh, with the Gang Alternative Program here in the city. A huge part of the heroin trade is being done by the gangs that exist in the city. Uh, we collect guns in December, and we've collected 99 weapons off the streets, shotguns, 32, 38, you know. and we're just barely on, on the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. But we have two specific questions. Well, one kid came up to me and he looked at me. They call them shorties. They deliver the drugs because nothing's going to happen to them. He says, are you 5 oh? And I said, no, I'm 6 foot. And, you know, because that's, that's a clear distinction. We have nothing to do with law enforcement. We just keep, try to get kids to do the right thing. Um, the question is twofold. One, um, there is a specific antidote that police officers are carrying in some of the major cities. And when they have a, a drug overdose, uh, of a heroin addict, they get injected with this antidote and can save their life between the time they find them and the time they go to the hospital. Second thing is uh, a needle exchange program. See, we deal with the end result. Uh, prevention if we can, but uh, Dr. Nevin Woods has been approached by myself, city fathers, to have a, a needle exchange where if you've got a dirty needle, which is the same as a loaded gun, uh, you exchange it, you get a clean needle. But this is proactive stuff, I would think. So if anybody has any ideas on that, but could you just answer those questions for me? Thank you. The Narcan is what it used to be. Uh, okay, and as far as the, the needle exchange, that would certainly not be anything involved with uh, the law enforcement side of it. Um, I, I think it would have to be on the medical side as well. Yeah. So I'll let the doctor talk about the needle. So uh, I can't speak specifically to the needle exchange program. Typically, that's, that's more of like a uh, community health. Uh, someone here may be able to, uh, I believe. Oh, hey, <laughs> Mike. Um, Dr. Nirenberg could, could speak more to that. Now, uh, EMS, uh, the ambulance services do carry Narcan, and so frequently, if we have a known overdose uh, out in the field, EMS will give the Narcan prior to them coming into the emergency department. Uh, I don't know if any any police officers carry the Narcan. Maybe uh, somebody can answer that. No. Uh, but EMS certainly. It's not necessarily Narcan, so major spread. So it seems to be a pattern. Yep. Um, so I know that some agencies are looking at doing that, uh, but I don't know if it's going to tell about it. Yeah. Typically, though, uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, whenever I've done ride-alongs with EMS, they get there around the same time, if not a little before, or just slightly after uh, the police do. So they're usually on the scene very quickly, and they can administer the Narcan uh, rapidly. Um, Dr. Nirenberg, would you like to elaborate on the uh, the needle exchange? Well, needle exchange, uh, there is a state law allowing physicians from the New York physicians and the New physicians to prescribe Narcan uh, to addicts and family members of addicts so that they have it on hand and don't have to use it in case of an overdose. So, uh, suggestion, my suggestion would be that. In the emergency room, if anyone comes in with an overdose and is sent home, they ought to go home with a prescription for Narcan. Or at the family doctor's offices, uh, if families ask for it, they can describe it as legally allowed as the state law has passed it by that. Narcan should be available. Uh, people can describe it and have it. And if you're an in your family, I would have it. I know several lines of that say that way. So that's not Narcan. Uh, there's no reason. I should be limited to law enforcement to read on that so everybody can get it. So ask me not to ask me to ask me. It should be all this time to. Needle exchange program is coming up. Well, uh, organized it. Okay. Uh, we hope to be up and running by the summer. We're getting through 
most of the political questions, and, uh, and we have support from everybody who needs to support it. Uh, we're arranging work on funding. Uh, we're pretty optimistic that's going to happen. Uh, and uh, details, as soon as we have the final details, we'll put it out there. Uh, this is going to be an anonymous thing. Uh, we're not trying to get anybody to give up drugs. We're just trying to get clean needles and encourage them, hopefully, when they you know, make a contact with a marginalized group. Uh, drug addicts are not very social. Uh, they don't trust a lot of people. And what our idea is, is one of the things that's going to build is trust so that when I do decide to need some help, maybe they'll come to us and say, how do I get it? Uh, the answer is to that. I'll also deal with health care needs uh, of addicts, um, testing for infectious diseases, which is an important issue that wasn't brought up here yet today. Um, but yes, there will be a needle exchange program in Pueblo fairly really soon. I'm working hard on it and we hope you'll myself. Thanks, Dr. Nurburg. Appreciate that. You know, uh, my deal is that uh, I've been directly uh, affected by this this deal here. And the thing is that if whatever you can possibly do in your life to um, get out there and actually pull up a phone records or anything like that, with anybody that's actually been dealing with that and, and smoking it, inhaling it, whatever kind of a uh, you know, don't be afraid to be a snitch, you know, because all you're going to do is you can just go ahead and stop somebody else from dying is, you know, do not be afraid. I've been, the thing is that I've been in this uh, city for all my life, and this is, uh, has had an impact for 20 years. Heroin isn't like just a brand new deal that just showed up here on the streets. There was people back in 35, 40 years ago that was using that stuff, you know. So, you know, anybody that says that uh, that this is all of a sudden like a brand new kind of deal, pick up your phone, your phone references. If you've got somebody in your life that has been affected by this, pick up your phone records and see who they were calling. Back up and go ahead and tell the cops. Don't be afraid. You know, that's the whole deal. You know, and then Thank this you. gentleman right here, Ray, right here, he, he, his, he had an article here in the paper that was just in the paper with one of my cousins. They wound up killing themselves with this stuff. And, you know, I mean, honest to God, you gotta, you gotta stop and think. Please, please do not be afraid. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks for sharing those comments. Ray? I just wanted to say briefly that uh, I think this meeting shows that uh, people who use drugs need to be in treatment centers, not in prison. Amen. Okay, we've got a question up here. Um, my question is, and I don't know who to direct it to, but um, if you have a loved one that you assume is addicted, what is the best way to get them help? Because, you know, they're going to become aggressive, they're in denial, they don't do that. What is the best way to go about that? What a great question. So, I know Diane Hayhurst is back there and she's kind of was my mentor on this thing, so if I mess it up, Diane, throw something at me from here. Um, now, if you can put somebody in treatment against their will, it's called an emergency commitment, and then an involuntary commitment would be the next thing. So first they have to, like, if, if they're a danger to themselves or they're, they're a danger to others, first they would have to be high at the time, have evidence, family letters, family come and say, that, that they are a danger to themselves and others, then you would go for an emergency commitment. That emergency commitment would lock them up for five days. You could look at treatment options. You could look at, you know, getting them sober. Do they want to get help? Now, if they continue to do what they keep doing, then later you could apply for an involuntary commitment, which will actually force them into treatment. 
So that's like if everything else fails, emergency commitment, then involuntary commitment. And I believe you could just still dial 5466666, right? Then so 546, just just all sixes, five four and six 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 six. Just keep pressing it. And so um, <laughs> so that is uh, that is the way. But I would say anytime if you're asking that question, probably they're not wanting to hear it. You know, and and any of us out there, I know. A lot of us do. I'll go out into the community. Um, I have run, do a program for Crossroads called Rep Recovery Education and Prevention. I meet with families, and I don't mind giving you my number. It's two five two two seven three seven, and that's my Crossroads phone number. And if you want questions about addict to athlete, go to addictathlete.org, and, and we have a great website with everything on there. But my personal, my number for Crossroads is two five two two seven three seven, and and if I can't help. We have somebody at Crossroads that can help you, so that's probably the best options for you. Hi, um, I'm speaking as a twenty-second birthday. I have to call my son Scott from his closet. Emergency was called. He had two seizures at the location of our camp. He was taken in two doctor by a nurse. His heart stopped for 20 minutes. Then he had to wait before they were able to do that. We were told the following Tuesday that there was no hope that he would be taken off the bed when he was running the following Friday. I had researched. We would go and see him in the hospital. His eyes did not get me open his eyes to put me in the drops. He was staring straight ahead. There was no movement. He had no pupil reaction to look. We were told by the doctor that if he could survive, we would get the life support, that he would be, it would be minutes, hours, maybe days, maybe not two weeks. If he didn't survive longer than that, he would be in a vegetated state. And we'd be in a very simple for the rest of his life. He was in a very good state. In his coma, he spent for two hours. The hyperbaric state, they went in through his thigh and inserted a balloon with ice water going through his body, circulating through that balloon to keep his organs and his. Extremities from needing oxygen, so that oxygen from his brain. The doctor met with us at the following Tuesday, and he said that he was operating just on brain strength, and any movement was just reflex action. We were looking for signs of life every time he had a tear in his eye, um, his hand, anything. We were hoping we would be him. Life support is going to be removed that Friday evening. I got a call from the nurse this Friday evening saying that they had noticed the tiny signs not to be fully optimistic, though, because I could do a surge before he was ready to pass During the day, during Friday, he advanced the morning movement, not mentioned. His eyes were open, his eyes were taken. We got a lot of us to witness a miracle. I said, Can you add to us? Sadly, it did really well. Sunday, I had a conference with the doctor that had given us this news because I found out there was a little bit more that he was supposed to do at the end and based on his diagnosis, his pregnancy. Um, we had a discussion, and I said he's going to be the narrow from fourth floor ICU to second floor ICU. And second floor ICU, the following day, he said, I'm going to check. So we moved him, then we had to put him in one of the tubes and the feeding tubes, and he was talking to us. And like I said, God allowed us to witness the miracle, and it's breaking my heart right now. He, we were able to talk to him to stay in good physical therapy. He's in second place physical therapy right now. 
he will be released thirsty, and he has no desire for recovery. But no desire. He can sit and hear about his own. This is his fifth hospitalization. And he thinks he can do it on his own. And I need to tell you the range of emotion. We had planned his funeral. We had arranged an organ donation. We had arranged the science research to voluntarily give his brain for addiction research. And he has no idea what we're looking for. He has no idea what we're looking for. And he's over in physical therapy right now, counting moments before he can go home. And, you know, we're talking about in residence treatment. And he's telling us it's not going to work. That was so brave of you to share that, and thank you. And we may have a, a resource for you. I was also wondering if perhaps Rod and Eric could go over maybe tomorrow and talk with us then. I'll have to give you a call for it to be able to get him to see him. If we could talk with him. I'll give you a card before we leave. One of the things I was going to mention. One of the things I was going to mention that could be an option, I'm not sure where he's, what hospital he's in, but each of the facilities has an assessment team that can go up to the medical floors and talk to individuals and at least provide them with some education and give them the resources. Um, our program here is voluntary for our chemical dependency unit, but a lot of times if we're reaching out to somebody and at least giving them the resource and completing that assessment, a lot of times people, their family may think they have an issue and they're not necessarily seeing it as an issue until maybe they talk with somebody and get someone else's perspective who's not so close or who's not a family member. Um, so if I'm not sure if he's here, but we have a team that could go up and meet with him, talk about the resources. <coughs> they have done that? Okay. <laughs> okay, we're, we're already almost 15 minutes over on time, and I know that lots of you need to go and you're up and leaving, so I want to have one more question. I have a question. Um, I lost my brother six years ago to a drug overdose. Um, my parents are now raising my niece. Her mom is in a Kelly County jail um, for heroin. And um, just series over and over and over and over. Um, she was released last week by mistake to go to um, a halfway house. Um, the sheriff's department wasn't there, and so um, she went and she got high with the um, funds that she had from the county jail. And the judge um, is sentencing her again to um, Hudson, the halfway house there, and the same community that she was getting high in. So my question is, where is the law enforcement side on all of this if there is a lot of addiction? Because now my family, um, she, she is going to go get high. She, she is not going to get a job and do her two years in halfway house. Um, we've written a letter to the judge and pleaded on behalf of our family. Um, where is the law enforcement side working with the addiction side to this? So. Um, you know, everybody has compelling stories, and yours is one that it's repeated over and over. Um, the same for this lady back here. Who, who would ever, does anybody here want to take her place? One minute of her life? Does anybody want to take one minute of your sister's life? And I will tell you that law enforcement, you got to remember, and it's a fine line, and this isn't a, a cop-out, this is what we do. We enforce the laws that people make. All right, we don't have the luxury. Eric and Rob talked about, I am a draw line in the sand kind of guy. Because you know what, I'm simple. I don't have the luxury of what people think, what, or what I get to think about marijuana. You know why? Because marijuana is against the law and it's against federal law. I'm a federal drug agent. I don't get to have an opinion on that. All right? 
Though sometimes things suck. Life sucks. Life's hard. You know what? It's as, as, as my preacher always tells me, it's easy to be bad, and it is the most difficult thing that we can all do to be good. Plain and simple. There's hurdles in all of our lives that we don't have the option to choose on what law we want to enforce and what law we don't. You know? I can't I, I can tell you that the Pueblo County Sheriff's Office is the one of the most diligent sheriff's offices in this state. We are human beings. I tell my guys all the time, I will tell you right now, I make no bones about it. We are a very oppressive unit. That is what we get paid to do. And if we happen to break a window every once in a while, or we stub our toe, it's okay as long as it's not malicious. We're human beings. And you know what? But that is not the answer that you want because you are tired of living the life that you're living. Your parents are tired of living the life that they're living. This lady back here is tired of her son being in the hospital and the fact that she's had to live what she's had to and he has no desire to get better. There's absolutely no fun in that. But I can tell you this. You know what? This, this right here is the start of something. I said it earlier. I don't. I, you guys expect me to get up here and beat the drug. The drum. Drugs are bad. I am a warrior, just like they are. They're a warrior for themselves, all right? I'm a warrior for you. This guy right here in uniform, the sheriff, they're warriors for you, all right? I get it. I've had 26 years of people being pissed off at me because I wasn't there in time. I understand. But I take the challenge every day. But you got to understand is you can't be aggravated at us because we're enforcing the laws that we're bound to enforce. And I don't say that haphazardly. All right. I know there was a gentleman back there who said, you know what, drug users shouldn't be in jail. We don't put drug users in jail. All right, Not my agency. That's not what we do. But if you don't want to put drug users in jail, then call your congressman and tell them to change the law. I can't, I can't put it any other simpler than that. It saved his life. They just got up here and told you about that it, one of them had scared the bejesus out of them and the other one it didn't. All right? I, I, I don't, you know, so I mean, I, I say that. I, I feel your pain. But you people right now need to get up and get the wave rolling because people are what's going to make a difference in this. All right? Army men fight wars. All right? And everybody's pissed off about them afterwards because we fight wars that we ask them to go fight. Cops fight the, the battle in the trenches every day. All right? I fight the drug war. People will tell me right now that the drug wars are complete loss. I will tell you that I will stand up and argue that all day long. Because I guarantee you, can you imagine what this place would be like if we weren't here? Plain and simple. Because I got 30 bad dudes that go out there and take the fight to the street every day around this community. And I couldn't be proud of them. But you know what? <laughs> but I will tell you, there's a lot of people in this room that life sucks. And I, 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 it breaks my heart. It truly does. I see it every day. But it's, it's, it's not the point to where you can start pointing fingers at people because when you start pointing fingers, when people deserve to be in trouble or they've made a mistake, they should, that mistake should be brought to them. But to point a finger at somebody because it makes you feel good or it lessens your pain or you're just simply pissed off about life, it, it doesn't do any good. So I say to you, you know what? There's people here in the sheriff's office. Find out. Talk to these guys right here. They made it. He's a walking, flipping miracle. <laughs> you know? This poor lady back here, her son didn't, hasn't gotten it yet. He should have been dead over and over. So that's the life, you know what? Some have it and some don't. I, I don't know how else to say it, but I mean, you can't, you can't get upset and realize that you know, what law enforcement is doing, we're bound that we don't have the decision or the opportunity to sit here and contemplate whether or not I want to stand in this box. I didn't want to stand in this box when they told me to stand in the box. They put a sign up for me right there that says, hey, big bughead, stay in the box. I don't want to stay in the box. It's stupid that i got to stay in the box. But you know what? I'm, that's, that's the life we live, but there's rules. And we're bound by them. I don't get to cross over that line and decide I want to step out of the box. She told me I couldn't. It's as simple as that. We're bound by that. 
Somebody else had something real quick, and I know we got to go. Would you? Yes. Is it for me or somebody else? Well, I mean, most likely you, because you had mentioned you know, that we need to stand up and change the law and, and stand up for it. How far away are we from actually uh, developing non crushable or smokable prescription pain relievers on opiates? I mean, that's one of the biggest problems with the medical. I mean, it's a legal substance. They're heavily abused. You read off all the overdose uh, how much they were prescribed within a year. But yet, the medical uh, industry is developing these drugs that are getting people hooked. And that's how they make money. Just like the drug dealers in Mexico, just like anybody else, the drug industry is making the money off of us, getting us hooked. And so that that's out. where we need to change the law. It is. It is. It is. It is. So there's, there's actually a, a kind of an interesting point to that. Um, I guess it was probably 15 years ago or so. Um, and this, this was kind of in the Medicare Medicaid office. We started to see uh, a change in, in the way that, that we were addressing, uh, in particular, pain. They, they called it the, the six bottle side. So <clears throat> whenever you're... Uh, you know, it, it, we, we had to start treating pain more aggressively. And one of the first places that a lot of people turned to was the narcotic pain medications. Now, granted, we, we do have a lot of other adjuncts that, that uh, can be used, but it, there, there started to be an increase in the number of narcotic prescriptions. And this was directly related to a mandate that was passed down upon us. Uh, of course, you know, the, the drug companies, like you said, uh, I mean, they seized on, on their opportunity to... Uh, to make their profits as well. Uh, now, with with some of the extended release narcotics, they were supposed to be non-crushable, and of course, people found different ways to to thwart that. And, and unfortunately, we're we're kind of battling a problem that we didn't see from the beginning. You know, things just kind of ratcheted up, and then we're like, you know, we're we're standing here a couple of years later saying, hey, we've got a problem now. Um, with drug databases. We can actually look up and see, you know, is is this patient that we're seeing coming in for for a general pain complaint? Have they been seeing multiple physicians? And, and and I can tell you on multiple instances, yes, you know, that was definitely going on. Um, I feel that I have been seeing a lot less <laughs> narcotic seeking within the emergency department. Um, there has been a limitation in the numbers of medications that are given that are given out. Um, both through the emergency department and out in the community. Uh, ideally, the emergency department should be able to get you through about three days until you can get back into your, your regular provider. Um, there, there were a few providers within the community that were uh, kind of your, your bad eggs that were providing a lot higher doses of medications. Um, through, I guess, through the DEA and, and through other organizations, some of these people have uh, seen limitations to their prescribing rights. And, you know, unfortunately, to those people who were addicted, they, they moved to the next viable option, which were either buying it off the street or, as those medications dried up, they moved over to heroin and other sources. So, uh, unfortunately, it's it's a problem that that we're starting to address now. Uh, we didn't realize it was a problem until only a few years ago. Uh, if you look at the it, the span of approximately 10 years, we saw a, about a fourfold increase in the number of uh, narcotics-related uh, deaths and hospitalizations, but we saw about an eight-fold increase in the number of narcotic <laughs> prescriptions being given out. So, you know, we're seeing fewer people using more medications, and therefore, you're having larger complications, you know. It would be one thing if the amount of drugs being prescribed went up by a factor of four, and then we saw an increase in a factor of four on, on the hospitalizations, but we're not seeing that. We are seeing fewer people. I mean, there's definitely an increase in the number of people, but not concomitant with the, the number of drugs that are being prescribed. So that means that people are indeed using more drugs. So. Right, well, thank you all so much for coming. As, as many of the presenters said, we've taken a huge step tonight. Filling this room was amazing. And I know lots of you have amazing stories to tell, and heartfelt stories to tell, and meaningful stories to tell. And Rob had mentioned that Crossroads is looking at doing an event where you can share those stories. So stop downstairs at the Crossroads booth on the way out, stop and talk to Rob, 
and Rob will get your email address and send you some more information on that. So again, thank you so much for coming. I hope you're going away with some good information. Thank you to the Park Team Mobile Nurses for organizing this. Amazing job, ladies. Thank you.